Uh, so thank you. Thank you very, very much for what we just experienced. And what I mean by that is, um, so a little smaller crowd, a little lacking on sleep, uh, but I observed you entering in and, and worshiping. And, and um, like I looked around and there were some people that were swaying. There were some people with both arms just before the Lord. Um, I want to commend Lanny, Lanny back in the back. Lanny, I saw her swaying and her hands on her, on her walker. Like if Lanny could worship God and demonstrate, like come on, come on, right? God wants all of us, our emotions, our, uh, our heart, our mind, our attention, our whole being. And, uh, you know, you've heard me say, we, we don't want to play church. There's a lot of better things to do with your time than just come and do some kind of religious exercise. That's not what church is. Church is the body of Christ, that's you and me, gathering together to worship his name. And so it blesses my heart, yes, thank you, I heard an amen over there. It blesses my heart to see people entering into worship. It blesses me when I hear uh, Hector and others say amen. You know, it's okay to like give feedback to God. It's okay to give feedback to truth when the pastor is preaching. It helps, I promise. If you don't believe that, then I invite you to come up here and preach next week to a silent crowd. But let's bring our whole self into this moment. And, and for the next few moments, I, I, I would like for you to just give your undivided attention uh, to a very important thing that we're going to be talking about in Acts. Uh, but before that, I need to make an announcement um, to mainly to our online audience. We're going to put this in an email as well, but there's a number of people that watch online uh, and, and we don't have your email address. So we don't have a way of communicating with you except in the service right now. And so I just need to share this announcement uh, that starting next week, we are not going to have the live stream any longer for a season. So we're going to pause our live stream as we make some adjustments. Uh, and so if you are one of those that, that watch online, and I know that we have people in other states, we have other people in other time zones, we have people here locally. Um, church isn't going away. If you are here local and you usually watch on online, I want to encourage you, come in person next, next week at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you are somebody who watches uh, and follows along out of the state or out of the region, and you're not able to physically come here, uh, I want to let you know the sermons will, will be posted on Tuesdays. So you'll still be able to keep current with our current sermon series and, and all of that, but the live stream will not be taking place, but you will be able to, to watch not only the current series, but we've gone through a backlog, and so we've got three years worth of sermons that are now on our YouTube channel that are um, they're grouped by sermon series. Uh, so there's a lot of material out there, and I want to encourage you uh, to, to jump in and, and partake of that. But we'd love to have you here in person. So this morning, we're going to continue on in Acts. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 36. But let me remind us uh, where we are in the story and how we got here. So as you recall, Jesus, he, he had a, a gathering of his followers and, and we estimate that to be over a hundred. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people Jesus was talking to at the beginning of, of Acts in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But we anticipate that it was most of his followers that, that had gathered later in the upper room. And we know that number to be about 120. So Jesus gathered together with them and he, he said... Stay here. Wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power 
When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to receive power and you're going to literally transform the world. You're going to begin to share who I am. You're going to begin to share what I have done. You will be a witness and you will be empowered by my Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus is saying, wait for, wait for. It's what John in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 3, uh, when he has people gathered around and he's baptizing people, he, he says, hey, um, there's one that's coming after me. I baptize you with water, but there's one that's coming after me who's going to baptize you in the Spirit and with fire. So that's what Jesus is telling his disciples, his followers, that's going to take place. And then he ascends into heaven. And we talked about that. And that is unbelievable. And that is just it. in the same way that he ascended into heaven, he's going to return. And it was powerful. And, and what did his followers do? They were obedient and they waited and they pressed in and they prayed. They didn't know how long, but they waited. And the Holy Spirit came and it began to transform that group, and all of Jerusalem. And people started showing, gathering around because they're like, what is going on? There was, this, there was this visible demonstration of the Holy Spirit that was taking place. And, and so in this moment, people come alongside and they're like, what is going on? And some people are like, wow, God is moving. And other people are like, this is jacked up. These people are drunk. And Peter steps up. The same Peter that denied Christ and was really kind of a wimp seven weeks before. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, he stands up and he says, you guys, they, they're not drunk. That's absurd. It's nine in the morning. They're not drunk. But what you're seeing is what the prophet Joel talked about. And we looked at that. The prophet Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Men, women, young, and old, doesn't matter your station in life. It doesn't matter if you're about to be married. It doesn't matter if you're about to be retired. It doesn't matter what stage, who you are, that, that, that God will pour out his spirit on his servants. Oh, that's the only prerequisite right there. His servants. So those that have said, I'm in for following Jesus... The prophet Joel, confirmed by Peter through the Holy Spirit, said, this is what's going on. These people aren't drunk. This is God's Spirit. And then last week we looked because Peter then went on and, and, and began to describe Jesus' role and said not only did the prophet Joel talk about this moment when the Holy Spirit would begin to fall in the last days, but, but then King David was talking about Jesus as Savior, and, and we looked at what it meant to be glad last week, because David kept saying, I am glad because, of, because God is with me, and God is, is the Savior. And, and, and then we looked at what that means to have this, this perspective of yes... Jesus ascended to heaven, and, and it's not like there's just like this, okay, what, what does that mean? Like, okay, that happened, and now we're just in this waiting game. No, no, no. What that means is Jesus is on the throne. Wow. And so we have to realign our perspective a little bit, and we talked about having gladness because we understand that perspective that Jesus is on the throne. And so, so Peter is like explaining to this. He's like, this is what Jesus promised. This is what Joel talked about. This is what David talked about. And, and here's what's going on. And then he gets to the conviction part. And it says this. Verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter takes them on a journey. Again, some people are like excited because they know that God is moving. Some people are skeptical because they think that people are drunk. Whether they were excited or whether they're skeptical, they have now heard from Peter, anointed by the Holy Spirit, begin to explain what they're seeing and what they're experiencing and then 
the conviction comes in because he says, whom you crucified. Ouch. You know, if the story ended right there, it would be horrible. Because how many can honestly say that you've had a season in your life and perhaps some people are in a season right now where you've rejected God. And you see, if the story ended right there, then it's like, oh my goodness, like this grace, this outpouring, this amazing moment in history was only for the 120 in the upper room. But no, in the midst of Peter saying, you rejected God, you rejected his son, you rejected Jesus, you killed him. That's the ultimate rejection. In the midst of that moment, there's this message of grace. Verse 37 says this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. (coughs) Excuse me saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who had received his words were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. You see, there's this, this, this conviction. It says they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. Now, They wanted to know how to respond. You see, that's probably the most critical thing that any of us would have to grapple with. Because all of us at one point or another have rejected God. The question is, what do we do with that? And it it says that when they were confronted with the truth, when they were confronted with reality, it was, they were cut to the heart. It's like this incredible sorrow. It's the same sorrow that we see in uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 10 says this, For godly sorrow produces a repentance. You see, they were cut to the heart. They had this sorrow, and it, and it says that type of godly being cut to the heart... That sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas the world produces, the worldly grief produces death. I really like how this is um, translated in the New Living Translation. Let me, let me read this. It says, for the kind of sorrow, again, this is the same idea of, of this audience that Peter is speaking to and that says they were cut to the heart. That's what this same concept is, this sorrow. But, but listen to this in the New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For this kind of sorrow God wants us to experience. Did you catch that? This kind of sorrow God wants you to experience. Now, on the, on the surface, that may not seem like it registers or logical, like, but wait a second. No, no, no. There is a, a godly sorrow that goes on to say, God wants us to experience this that leads us away from sin and results in salvation. You see, a godly sorrow is, is actually uh, designed by God to do what we see in this first century. It cuts people to the heart not to leave them there, not to kick them to the ground, not to say, you, you, you're so lame. It's, but it's to lead to repentance and salvation. It goes on to say, there's no regret for that kind of sorrow. None whatsoever. 
But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Now, that's a huge, huge, important concept right there. Because, again, we've all rejected God at some point or another, and I'm going to suggest that even as a follower of Jesus, we have little moments throughout our week where we choose to reject God. It's called sin. It's called acting on a sin when we know better, we have our conscience, we know the Holy Spirit, we know truth, and yet in those moments, you and I make mistakes. Yes, I, as your pastor, we make mistakes. We have these moments where we choose us and we reject God. But what what this is saying is there is a repentance There's this cutting to the heart. There's this like, I know that I've rejected God. And and, and what should I do? There's this repentance as a response. But you see the opposite of that. It says, but worldly sorrow. What's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow is kind of like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Or... Sometimes, uh, if any of you are parents and you see this in your kids, it's almost like your kid is like, I'm sorry I got caught. You see, a worldly sorrow says this, a worldly sorrow results in spiritual death. You see, a I'm sorry but not repentant leads to spiritual death. It creates separation in our intimate relationship with God. So so what we're seeing right here is this really, really important concept that when confronted with the realities of truth, even the people who were like, you guys are drunk, they were confronted with this godly sorrow and it leads to repentance. So in verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And so this morning, this is what we're going to be talking about. We're talking about baptism. We're talking about the significance of baptism, the commandment of baptism, uh, why it matters, why we do it. What does the Bible have to say about it? Does it matter if it's, uh, you know, something that's done as a baby, as, a, as an adult? Uh, what is this? Why are we doing this? Well, be, because on Palm Sunday, I think that's in three Sundays from now, if, if I'm doing my math right, We're going to have a baptism service as part of our celebration. I think it's incredibly fitting. We, you know, Palm Sunday is is recognizing when Jesus came into Jerusalem and, and the whole city was like, the Messiah. God with us is with is really with us. And it's a celebration. And, and, and in that moment, there was a lot of people that were all in. And unfortunately, as the week progressed and we went through the passion and ultimately Jesus was crucified, you could tell that people weren't quite as all in as they were when they were shouting and he was coming in Jerusalem a week before. But nonetheless, it is a proclamation that the Messiah has come. And that's what we do on Palm Sunday. And and I thought it would be really fitting for us to have baptisms on that Sunday as well. Because a baptism, and we're going to see this, is a proclamation that God has come into my life. In the same way that when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and there was a proclamation and the words, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were praising. That's what baptism is. In in one aspect, it's a proclamation. God has shown up. And I'm praising him. That's pretty cool. But this is why we're looking at this. And, and so I want to spend a little time. We're going to spend the mo- the, our moment, moments this morning really zeroing in on verse 38. To help us understand why we, we believe what the Bible says about baptism, what it means to you and I, why it's so important and why we would take the time. By the way, um, we're not a huge church, as you can tell, Right? Um, it looks like 
based on what interest has already um, been shared with me about people that want to get baptized, uh, that we'll have perhaps as many as eight people get baptized on Palm Sunday, which is going to put us at 20. Yeah, that's awesome. Which is going to put us at 20 or more baptisms in the past two years. Now, I'm telling you, a church our size, that is encouraging. Why is it so encouraging? Because this is not just something that is routine. This is a decision that somebody says, I am all in for Jesus Christ, and I'm following in this uh, commandment to be baptized. So we want to look at it. It's important. So in verse 38, there's a couple of things that are key. And the first one, we, we just hinted to it. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for your forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when he says repent, again, this is a a sorrow, a godly sorrow. This is a this is an about face. So, those of you who have indicated to me or shared with somebody else who let me know that you want to get baptized, and or those that are you're thinking about it, um, I, I want us to to linger on this word repent for just a second because it is critical. You see, repent, it, it, it's this Greek word, metanoia. Metanoia. It actually comes from two different Greek roots. Meta, not the metaverse, but actually similar to that because the Greek root of meta means completely other, completely different. Noia is of the mind. We get paranoia, okay? So when you combine meta and noia, completely different, completely other, and of the mind, what repentance means is my mind is completely different. I have made a decision to completely realign my thinking. That's what repentance is. I used to live my life this way. And I am now confronted with the reality and the truth of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it completely realigns my thinking. And that's what repentance is. And and can I tell you something? Repentance is something only you can do. No one else can do that for you. Somebody could could have a convincing argument. Somebody could convince you about the realities of an aspect of truth or get you to align with a political, uh, you know, argument or, uh, you know, talk to you about a scientific theory or, or, you know, relate to you about some kind of facts of history or something like that. And, And somebody can kind of like, by, by external kind of like interacting with you can perhaps get you to think about something differently. But ultimately, if you're going to have a metanoia, it's you deciding, I'm going to think completely differently about everything from this moment forward. That's what repentance is. So that's the very first step in this this. this Godly sorrow, when confronted with the truth, when confronted with the reality that we have rejected God, the first thing that has to happen is I have to get cut to the heart in such a way that I'm like, no one else can do this but me. I'm deciding to repent. I'm deciding to metanoia. That's the first step. And then it goes on, it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. So what's interesting here is that some people ask this question, and again, this morning it's a little bit more teachy, because I'm I'm trying to make sure we understand the significance and the realities of of baptism. Um, but, But some people ask the question, it says, in the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And in fact, uh, about six months ago, I got a call from somebody who used to go to this church years ago. And they're no longer in this area, uh, but she called and she had a very important question. And, uh, and she said, um, 
I've just learned that I need to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Now, um, years ago, when this church was called God's Family Church, and Pastor Alex was here, uh, she got baptized here. And she's like, I just need to know, was I baptized into the name of Jesus? And I'm like, well, Pastor Alex has passed away. But let me tell you what I know about Pastor Alex. And let me tell you what I know about our statement of faith. And I don't know the exact words that were proclaimed over you, but I guarantee you, if you got baptized in this church, you were baptized in the name of Jesus. And this is not a, a legalistic thing or anything like that, because sometimes people are like, well, well, wait a second, the Bible says get baptized in the name of Jesus, and, and what do we do here? Well, we go with Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is, is the Great Commission, and it says this. It says, go therefore and make disciples. That's make other, other followers of Jesus. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So when we take this section out of this wall and we reveal the mystery tank behind here, and hopefully the heater works, because I've been in it when it doesn't. And we baptize people. We're going to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son, which is the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Because, I mean, these were the words of Jesus, and I think they're kind of important. So we're going to follow that. But, but when it says baptized into the name of Jesus, what it's, what it's not saying is like, no, you don't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit, but you baptize in Jesus. It, that's not the point. The point is, is your baptism a baptism of repentance into the Lordship of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's what it's talking about. And there's a difference because in the Gospels, we read about John the Baptist. Ever heard of John the Baptist? Remember him? Weird guy. Eight bugs, okay? Actually, that's kind of in vogue now. Joking, but I'm not. Um, so John the Baptist, he baptized, and, and later we're going to see, actually in Acts, we're going to see uh, followers of Jesus who are following Jesus, and they don't even really know all the nuances of that. And they're like, we didn't even know that there was a Jesus and they're like, well, what baptism did you have? Well, we had John's baptism. That was a baptism of repentance. So, so here's, here's the point. Baptizing into the name of Jesus is saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm all in. I'm proclaiming to you. I'm proclaiming to everybody who's seeing this right now. I am all in. And see, John's baptism, which John was baptizing people before Jesus came on the scene. In fact, Jesus himself got baptized. Do you remember that? Jesus himself got baptized. He got baptized by John the Baptist. Now, up until that point, this baptism, it wasn't that it didn't have any value because people were coming because they, they were, it was called a baptism of repentance. It's like they recognized that they, they had junk in their life and they, they, they recognized that they had allowed a distance to grow between them and God. And, and, and they just, they wanted to come and, and, and do something to really kind of to make it right. But honestly, without the lordship of Jesus Christ, that was actually more of a religious act than anything else. And so that's why it's important for us to understand when it says baptized into the name of Jesus, that there is a lordship component to this. This isn't just a religious act. This is a, an act that follows repentance. And we're going to look at that in a, in a minute because I want us to understand the importance of baptism as somebody who's responding in repentance, responding with metanoia, and making a decision to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is very different than perhaps 
you know, different backgrounds probably represented in this room and online where, where um, perhaps you were baptized as, a, as an infant. But see, we're going to see how baptism into Jesus Christ is a acknowledgement of the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's a repentance. And that can't take place unless you decide to do that. I, I was so blessed. Um, Roger, when he, got, when he got baptized, and we did, we did a video uh, where he and others shared their testimony, you know, so they wouldn't have to be all nervous and hold a mic in the tank, which I don't even know if that's safe. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, sometimes it's, you don't want to tell people your story in front of people, you know. Uh, so what we did was we filmed uh, really short little clips of people saying why they were getting baptized. And when Roger got baptized, and I won't reveal his age, but he's, he's a senior in our group. He's the oldest gentleman that got baptized that day. And it was really cool because he says, you know, years ago, so he was baptized as an infant in the Catholic Church, and he says, years ago, somebody else made this decision for me. Today, I'm making this decision. That's what being baptized into the name and into the worship of Jesus Christ is. Now, it goes on to say there, now this, this kind of gets a little confusing too. Some, some people ask the question, have questions around this because it says, get baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And they're like, well, okay, question. Does that mean that baptism is the means by which my sins are forgiven? And, and see, it's, it's verses like this that cause some people to say, well, that's why we want to baptize a baby because we want their sins to be forgiven because what if they die before they wake up and they, or wake up, they grow up. What if they die before they grow up and, and, and they never made a commitment to follow Jesus? So, so we need to baptize them because that washes away their sins. That's not what this is saying. And, and we're, we know that. And there's another verse. It's in Acts 22. And, and it says something similar. And so this is, again, a little bit more of teaching this morning. But I, I want us to have a full understanding of the reality of baptism. Um, and this is when the Apostle Paul, remember the Apostle Paul? When he first got saved, he was having an interaction with a follower of Jesus by the name of Ananias. And it says this. Ananias tells Paul, you will be a witness for him, you will be a witness for Jesus, to everyone what you have seen and heard, and now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Now, there's two things that are really cool in this. Number one, the urgency. The urgency of this. It's like, wait a second, Paul. You've, you've come to the reality of who Jesus Christ is why are you waiting? Get baptized. Why are you waiting? Don't put it off. There's this urgency to it. And there's this beautiful story. And we'll read about it in Acts later. And, and this uh, Philip, who, who's one of the deacons, the early church deacons, he is, he's ministering to a, an official, an Ethiopian eunuch who's, who's in uh, Israel on business, and, and he doesn't understand the, the book Isaiah, and, and Philip hears him reading Isaiah, and Philip says, hey, do you want me to explain what that means? And the Ethiopian was like, yes, please do. And Philip began to explain all throughout the scriptures how it was pointing to Jesus Christ, and, and the Ethiopian was like, oh my goodness, I'm all in. Look, there's a puddle. Let's get, can we get baptized right now? So there's this beautiful moment uh, that we see several times in Scripture where somebody is like, I got to do it now. I have to do it now. And in fact, we've had a baptism service in the past where we had people scheduled and we had their baptism video, you know, their testimony video all ready to go and, and, and all this stuff. And, and we had people in the service. There's one gentleman that's like, wasn't planning on getting baptized. And in that moment, he's like, I'm all in. And he chose to get baptized. There's this sense of like urgency, like when the light comes on, the reality of who Jesus is. And when we get cut to the heart. 
And when we experience metanoia and our thinking is completely shifted, there's this urgency to respond. Because Jesus himself says, go into all the world baptizing and teaching people to follow all my commandments. This is a commandment. Jesus said, get baptized. Now, I know what can kind of happen. This thinking can kind of creep in and be like, I don't know. You know what? I'm all in for Jesus. I don't know if I really need to do that. You know, I got, I got saved so long ago and maybe, you know, I didn't do it then. And it's, you know, it's like I kind of passed my window, uh, you know, and, and um, maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe you're putting it off and can I just say it's a commandment and you know how we get into trouble as followers of Jesus? When we take this approach where we have an obedient, optional Christianity. Let me say that again. Get into trouble as followers of Jesus when we could slip into the thinking of obedient, optional Christianity. You see, there's no such thing as obedient, optional follower of Jesus. See, you're either a follower, which means I am walking in the ways that he is encouraging me to walk. I'm walking in his commandments. Or, I'm not walking in his commandments, which means I'm not really following him, right? Because he said, walk this way. So we can't get into this, uh, you know what, I don't think I really need to be baptized. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And, and so this is, this is important for us to, to understand that there's an urgency, there is a commandment. Um, but, but when we get to verses like this, when we get to this, this moment in which Paul, Paul says, I'm going to do it right now, or Ananias says, you should do it right now for the washing of your sins. And then we also read in Acts 2 where it says, um, for the forgiveness of your sins, that, that can kind of lead some with the impression, basically it's just these two verses which caused people to ask the question, is baptism what's actually washing my sins away? Is baptism actually what saves me? Is a better way of asking that question. And the answer is no. Baptism doesn't save you. You're commanded to walk into baptism, into this obedience. But we know this. We know this. The Great Commission is also listed in Mark. Uh, Mark 16. Mark 16 says this. We read the Great Commission in Matthew. Let's read it in Mark. It says this in, in Mark 16 and beginning in verse 15. It says, And he said to them, this is Jesus saying, Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So if you stop right there, you're like, okay, it's faith. Plus baptism, so does that mean baptism saves me? If there's any question, what does Jesus say right after that? But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So the question on if a person is either saved or condemned is based on belief. Where do they put their faith? And so we see an abundance of scripture. Uh, in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says this, because if you confess with your mouth, this is one of my favorite like salvation altar call scriptures, because sometimes we overcomplicate this decision to follow Jesus. It's so simple. It says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's saying, you're the boss of me. Jesus, you're the boss of me. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
Salvation comes from faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not that, okay, you're, until you get dunked in the tank, you're not saved. No. If you have professed a faith in Jesus Christ, that's what saves you. It's the belief that God is who he says he is and he does what he says he, he's going to do, including saving us from our sins. That belief and that faith is what saves us. We also see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you've been saved through baptism. No. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. This is what it means to be saved. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir in here. I, I look around and I, I know many of your stories. I don't know everybody's journey, but I know a lot of your stories. And so, so on one hand, you might be sitting here and, and thinking, like, this is a salvation message. I already accepted Jesus in my heart, okay? Here's the point. Baptism is a response to this reality. It's a response to the reality that Christ died on the cross for you and by faith you have accepted his lordship and his forgiveness and his grace. And baptism is a response to that. And it's a command and it should be done with urgency and it should be done with enthusiasm. It goes on to say, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about this is, is we might look at this and say, okay, um, the Holy Spirit just fell. People are speaking in tongues. There's obviously an empowerment. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that John said, Jesus, who's coming after me, he's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Now, baptize, when it's referring to Holy Spirit baptism, like John is talking about there. It's the same word as baptize as in go into all the world and be baptized. That word talks in our language uh, to the idea of full immersion, full saturation, full soaking. The analogy I like to use is you go to the beach and you forgot your swimsuit, but it's just too enticing and you jump in the ocean with your clothes on. And when you come out, you're like heavy. You're drenched. That's what this baptism is like. Now, when it says you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, some people are like, okay, um, does that mean when I get baptized in the tank that I'm going to come out speaking in tongues? No. No. You see, there's a difference here between receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay? So listen to this. In Romans 8, verse 9 through 11, it says this. You, however, are not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. So, so this gift that you receive, when you metanoia, when you repent... And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you get baptized, then, then what happens is, is the forgiveness of our sins and we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive this. Now, this is talked about by Jesus himself in John 14, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming. And he says this in John 14, it says uh, in verse 15, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper and he will be with you forever. He says, I'll ask the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to help you. He's going to be with you forever. Listen to this. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him because he dwells with you and will be in you. So can I just tell you this? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you follow him in baptism, and when you step out and you place your faith in him, you have received the Holy Spirit. 
You get the Holy Spirit. That's what, Acts, uh, that's what Romans 8 says. It says, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Are you on team Jesus? Have you yielded your life to him? Guess what? You can have communion with God because you've received the Holy Spirit. Now, we're in the book of Acts, and so we're going to see the difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit or the gifts in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is saying in, in Acts 1.8 when he says, wait, 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 don't leave. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's the baptizo. That's the drenched wet, the Holy Spirit. And if you've been a follower of Jesus, you know that there are times that God is inside you. You can hear his voice. He, he's talking to you. He's prompting you. He's, he's nudging you. Sometimes he's convicting you. You know that that's the spirit of God in you. But you may have also have experienced a time where the Holy Spirit is not just in you, but he's on you in such a way that his power is so evident and there is a moving and there is a giftedness and there is an anointing that comes and that is not something that you live in day in, day out, but that is the gifting of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But we can be assured of this. If you repent, you declare Jesus as Lord of your life, you follow in obedience and you've been baptized the promise is the Holy Spirit will be in you. It's a gift. And what's beautiful about that is, is evident in 1 Corinthians 6. It says this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Think about that. Wow. You mean my messed up body? You mean all of my perfections? The God of the universe has intimate dwelling with me, has an intimate walk with me. Ah, mind-blowing. It says, you have the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God. You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. Oh, that's so beautiful. So glorify God with your body. I'm going to ask Jonas to come up, and we're going to conclude with Romans 8. It says this, you, however, are not of the flesh, but you're in the spirit. In fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Listen to this. This is a wow moment, aha, an aha moment here. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I want you to think about that for a second. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead that's the Spirit of God. When we have that point in our life where we're cut to the heart and we have this God godly sorrow that leads us to repentance, that leads us to metanoia, a completely other way of thinking and an alignment of our life towards following Jesus Christ. And when we understand the significance of baptism, and how it is the first step in obedience to his lordship. We get the gift of the Holy Spirit, the same power that rose Christ from the dead. Guess what? Is intimate with you. No one who is a follower of Jesus, who's having an intimate walk with the Holy Spirit, can say they have spiritual loneliness. Now, we have all probably in one point of our life or another experienced earthly loneliness. When we're longing for somebody to be close to us. But the promise here is 
as a follower of Jesus who's walked this out. You have an intimacy with the God of the universe through the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will never, ever experience spiritual loneliness. That's exciting. I'm going to ask you to stand and bow your heads and I want to ask this question and I'm not going to ask you to come down front or anything like that. I, I, I'm not going to not going to put you on the spot. But whether you're in the room or you're tuning in online, I want you to just bow your head with, with me for a moment and I, I, I want to ask you to recall that moment, that point in your life where you have had that godly sorrow, where you were cut to the heart, where you knew, where you knew that the path that you were on was not the right path. And you became aware of the reality of Jesus Christ. And you repented. I want you to recall that. And I want you to be encouraged that when you did that and when you walk in obedience and no, no, no one is perfect and we're going to have bad weeks and you know, you might have had a bad day yesterday and you might have blown it yesterday. That, that's not what this, when you walk in obedience and when you, when you align your life and though you make mistakes, you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to repent and I'm gonna continue to follow and I'm gonna continue to make Jesus my Lord. You're promised intimacy. So I want you to think about that for a moment. So if you've already made that decision, I want you to just fix your eyes on that promise that the Holy Spirit is with you. Because I guarantee you, the enemy wants to make you think he's not. The enemy wants to, t to attack the child of God and make him or her think that God has, has abandoned you. Or maybe that you've abandoned God and you've gotten too far away from him and that is a lie. So I want you to fix your eyes on the promise that God is with you, his Holy Spirit is with you and in you. And I want to talk to somebody else in this room or online if you can't recall a time in which you look back and say, I know that I was cut to the heart and I metanoid, I repented, I realigned my thinking and I declared God to God that Jesus would be Lord of my life. If you cannot think of a time in which you did that, today you can do that. And with no one looking around in the room, I'm just going to ask you if that's you. I can't see you if you're online. If you're online, I'm saying just God sees you. Raise your hand. But if you're in this room and you have not had that moment, I'm asking you to raise your hand. I see hands. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. This is just a simple act of saying, I think there were four hands. If there were more, I, I'm sorry, I missed you, but there are at least four people of saying, I, 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 I cannot recall a moment in which I was struck to the heart in such a way that I repented. Can I just tell you this? I want you to just pray this silently as I repeat this verse. It's Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, pray that silently, confess with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you for the people that are recalling that time in their life where they repented and they found you, Jesus. And I pray that they would be reminded of that. And when the enemy comes and tries to steal their testimony or tries to make them feel alone or distant from you, God, I pray that they would remember the promise that you have given them yourself, that your Holy Spirit dwells within them. 
I pray that you would remind them of that day and that decision. And those that made the decision today, these four or more that have made the decision today to repent and to say, Lord, you are, you're the boss of me. God, I pray that you would seal that in their heart, that they would know that they know that they know that they know that they are saved, they are made righteous before you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence in this place. And I pray that you would just seal this moment with your Holy Spirit in each and every heart. In the name of Jesus, and we all said, amen. Now, we're going to worship, but I'm just going to ask you to think about something. On Palm Sunday, we're going to have baptisms. If you have not been baptized as an adult or as somebody who is old enough to consciously say, I'm cut to the heart, I repent, I'm following Jesus, I want to invite you to get baptized. I want to invite you to reach out to me, reach out to Brian or Haywood or one of the leaders, Ron, in the Sunday school class. Say, I, I want to get baptized. I want to learn more. Follow him in obedience. Amen? Let's worship.